with what we were just singing? I believe in the name of Jesus. Do you? Are you here just for a gathering, just a fellowship? Or are you here today to believe in the name of Jesus? Amen. Amen. If you would turn your attention uh, toward the screen this morning. Probably most of you here this morning have seen a similar uh, video of that story. I know the pastor has shown it many years ago, at least I'm pretty sure he had. 
But in thinking and studying for the message this morning, especially since this is, I guess, an international day of love, and of showing our expressions of love, I started thinking about our Father and about our Savior. The thought is really not as much love this morning as it is about sacrifice. Sacrifice. We're observing the holiday of love. You've probably told many people today that you love them, or maybe over the weekend, or you've called, and, you know, to make sure that those that are close to you know that you love them. But have you told the Lord today? Have you told God today how much you love Him? People spend money on this day that they really can't afford to show to that special someone that they are loved. What sacrifices will go into this day? I was watching the five-minute countdown, and it was some phenomenal amount. Wasn't it almost $40 million that will be spent on chocolates today in the world or on this season for Valentine's? That, I thought, you know, they were boosting the offering that in a year we gave $40,000 to mission. And all over the world, they'll spend almost $40 million on chocolate. At the end of the day, we know that the Bible teaches us that obedience is better than sacrifice. But I submit to you this morning that a fulfilling, intimate love with Christ will require sacrifice. I want to say that again. A fulfilling, intimate love with Christ will require sacrifice. The, the intent of my message today is twofold. First, to highlight the great sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ for every one of us. Secondly, to unction us to examine the degree of our sacrifice that we make because we're supposed to make a daily sacrifice for our relationship with Christ. We sacrifice many things at many times, but what do we sacrifice to make sure that our relationship with Jesus Christ... Now, I'm talking about sacrifice. Life is full of sacrifices. We sacrifice for people. We sacrifice for our jobs. Sometimes people lose, jo lose their job because of the sacrifices they make for their family. And the vice versa is true. Sometimes people lose their families for the sacrifices that they make on their jobs. I believe that sacrifice is not mutually separate from love. I believe they are interwoven. Best exemplified by the story, the video that we just watched of this precious family. Just to refresh a couple of the points. Rick, the son, made the statement, When I'm running, it's the only time I don't feel disabled. Dick, the father, he has run, ridden, swum literally thousands of miles to be with and support his son. Their athletic pursuits have enriched Rich's life, Rick's life, and it's had a tangible effect on the father, Dick's life as well. After a mild heart attack, the doctors told the father that he might have died 15 years earlier if he weren't in such good shape. And the father will say, and has made the statement, my son Rick saved my life. What sacrifice that a father would make for his son. And that's what I want to talk about today. David was commanded by the Lord to go up into Gad and to build an altar. While David is nearing, Aruna sees David and his entourage, and he goes out to meet them. David said he has come to buy the threshing floor and the oxen that is required. And that's where we pick up our story. And the king said unto Ariunah, no, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land, and the plague was stayed from Israel. Now place yourself in David's position. There he was, 
And he was coming, he was being obedient to God that told him to go by this sacrifice. So he is seen, David was well known, and he was given the altar, you can have whatever you want. You can take, you don't have to buy it. And David says, no, I will not offer to God a sacrifice that costs me nothing. How many times do we offer up to God things that have cost us nothing? Amen. I will not offer a sacrifice to God that which cost me nothing. How many times, now when we think of sacrifice, usually we think of an offering or we think of giving. And I think it was, was it last Sunday or the Sunday before that I shared during the worship, uh, last Sunday when I was boosting it, it wasn't during worship, it's when I was boosting the offering. And I said, so many times we'll look at the denomination of the bills in our wallet and we will decide what we're going to give and not give. And I shared with you that sometimes that I carry emergency money and I've tried to teach my children to do the same. Hide it away so you don't know it's there. And when you get in a situation and you don't have the cash that you need, you can think, oh, I've got that tucked away somewhere. Now, sometimes in my giving, you know, and that's usually what I'll do. I'll look in my wallet when I'm giving in an offering, and I'll give the largest denomination that I have. But sometimes God will remind me that isn't the largest denomination of a bill that you've got in your wallet, Ron. You see, I know where you've got your money hidden, and that's what I want you to give. Amen? Amen. If we'll listen to God, he'll keep us out of trouble. And sometimes our offering is not as simple. Our physical offering is not as simple as looking in our wallet and saying, okay, I've got a, a 20 and a 10 and a 5. Okay, I'm going to give the greatest amount I got. I'm going to give the 20. It's not always that simple. You have to be obedient to God. And sometimes God requires sacrifice. Amen. So many times I'm willing to act like a Christian as long as it doesn't cost me anything. Did you get that? So many times I'm willing to act like a Christian as long as it's not costing me anything to do. What does the word sacrifice mean to you this morning? We sacrifice for our family, for our kids, for our spouses. Sometimes we even sacrifice, as I mentioned, for our jobs. Romans 12 and 1 says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I've often thought sometimes as I was pastoring, wouldn't it be great to have a coffin-sized offering basket? Now, it's only coffin size because it's large enough for a body to lay in. That when an offering was taken, sometimes God doesn't want what you've got in your wallet. He wants you. He wants your life. He wants everything you are. And if we would just give it up, he could make our lives so much greater. Mark 10, 37 through 42. Now, now, this is the picture of James and John. You know, they're sit, all sitting around the table, and they're asking this, Can one of us sit at the left hand and the right hand? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on the right hand and the other on the left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? And can you be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, we can. And Christ replies, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand, it is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them of whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Now think about this picture. Here are two of the disciples sitting on the left and right, and those were supposed to be very prominent positions, sitting especially next to Christ. So they start stop thinking about that dinner that's going on, and they begin thinking about long after that. And they want to assure that they're going to have their place to be, to reign, to, to be directly by Christ. Well, there were some other people sitting around that table. 
You know, it's kind of like a kid vying for your attention. And maybe you've got multiple kids and they all try to interchange to find that place. With my grandkids, sometimes I'll be holding one of them and then all of a sudden another one will come. And then all of a sudden another one will come and maybe even start trying to slap them away. You see, do we have that kind? Now, now I'm not really condemning James and John. I'm not saying their heart was altogether in the wrong place. But how many of us are really vying for the attention of our Savior? How many of us want to be the one that he knows we want to give? We want to give the offering. We want to give the praise. We want to give the worship that he will see us. Over and over it's depicted in the word where, where many that were lame, that were blind, they would yell out in the crowd, even the blind that could not see, they would yell out, oh Jesus! Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And when the crowd would try to quiet them, they wanted the attention of Christ. <laughs> Do you want the attention of Christ? Did the worship that you offered up just a few moments ago, did that vie for the attention of Christ? Were you separated from the crowd? Did God see your worship? I'll let that think in. Sink in and think in. <laughs> think of these questions. I'm willing to serve God if. I'm willing to serve God if. Because many times we as Christians ultimatum God. We try to present an ultimatum to him. Sometimes even when we're fasting, it's, you know, we go into it with the intent that we're going to change the mind of God. We're going to get something out of this. I'm willing to serve God if. Or I'm willing to serve God as long. Only you can finish that. Or finally, I'm willing to serve God regardless. I will serve him. I will worship him. If I am never healed, I'm going to worship him. If I never have any riches to speak of, I'm going to worship him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to praise him. If I have to suffer through this affliction the remaining days of my life, I will offer up the sacrifice of praise unto my God. Did you get that? I will offer up the sacrifice of praise. When my arms and my hands are permeated with arthritis and pain, I will lift up my hands to the Lord. When my voice is weak and hoarse and it's hard to get words out, I will offer up a sacrifice of praise to my God. I will serve God regardless. John 15 and 13 says this, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That a man lay down his life for his friends. We see it all the time. We see it on movies and shows that people take bullets for other people, literally. Christ went to the cross. He sacrificed his very life for every one of us today. The Apostle Paul didn't see sacrifice as an obligation, but he saw sacrifice as a blessing. Sacrifice is a doorway to the blessings of God. I'm going to read a lot of scriptures. I'm going to inundate you for a moment, and they're not, even, they're not going to be up there. Galatians 2 and 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself for me. Romans 8 and 32. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Galatians 1, 3, and 4. Grace be to you, grace be to your and the peace from God the Father. And from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. 
Ephesians 5 and 2. And walk in love as Christ hath also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. Over and over it reminds us of the sacrifice that our Savior has made and gave the love that he had for us. 1 Timothy 2 and 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And finally, Titus 2 and 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself. A peculiar people, zealous of good works. He gave everything, and it says to look to him, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who gave it all. We sing the songs, we hear the scriptures, but do we really realize the great cost that Christ gave us? We just take it so freely and just so sometimes unsacrificially. Ephesians 5 and 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ has also loved the church and gave himself for it, laid down his life for his people. Jesus knew sacrifice. The Apostle Paul knew sacrifice. The more important question I want to ask you today, do you know sacrifice? Does your relationship with Christ involve any sacrifice? Whenever God has required sacrifice, it opens up a special intimacy. God uses sacrifice to give us our life back. We can look back to that video of the father and the son. The father hadn't been a runner, but his son wanted to be normal, so he began doing that and began uh, getting in better shape and, be and became a good runner. And by him doing that and sacrificing that, it saved his own life. Jesus had to leave his home and leave the comforts and took on the body of a sacrifice. For Isaiah 53 and 3 tells us all about it. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. He took it all on himself. And we cannot afford to take the sacrifice of our Savior, the love that he had for each one of us lightly. Isaiah 53 and 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Do you remember in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 11, the story that the Apostle Paul depicts? Just going to share a little bit of, of it. Paul was allowed to see this heavenly vision. He was allowed to actually see the seventh heaven. And because of that, God placed a thorn in him. Many have debated what that thorn was. God used the pain to keep Paul humble. You see, it was literally the Lord's will to crush him. To keep him humble. Now, you would say, well, what kind of father is that that would allow him to ascend to the heights of that glory to see what no one of that day had seen, to see that vision? And, and, and I can't even imagine what it would have been like to see it and to feel it and to experience the awesomeness of God. And it was so great. And then to come back to reality of the world of sin that you live in, and then a thorn is placed on you to keep you humble. Now, does that make sense? Did Paul ever complain about it? 
No, Paul recognized the sacrifice. You see, the sacrifice of, of, of being able to see things that most people, that most Christians cannot see is you're going to have to keep yourself humble about it. And God cares enough and loves you enough to say, you're going to have to experience this in order to experience this. And isn't that worth the sacrifice? What great love of a father. And I know some of you are thinking, you're saying, well, I just don't understand. I'm a father and I don't know. I mean, sometimes you have to say no. And that's a hard thing to do. But sometimes there has to be pain inflicted or punishment inflicted. But you've got a goal in mind that you want them to become stronger and to become better about making their decisions. My daughter always is telling Izzy, now make a good decision. Maybe we ought to look ourselves in the mirror every morning and we ought to ask ourselves this, now make good decisions today. Make good decisions today, but sometimes we don't make good decisions and bad things happen and then we go crying to God about it. Amen? Anybody ever been there? Anybody just ever had a real pity party for your... <laughs> Why is you made the wrong decision? You did the wrong thing. But that's really not my message this morning. We look at Elisha. He could heal everyone else but himself. You get that? He could heal everyone else but himself he couldn't heal. Hosea was a godly man, and he married the wrong woman. She was a very, very difficult woman. Did God make her marry him? Her? No. Job lost everything. Hannah suffered through years of infertility and pain. You see, getting close to God is not a guarantee that you're necessarily going to be affluent or that you're going to have ease. But on the contrary, when we try to get close to God, we enroll in the difficult school of improving our character. It's like, you know, you will never experience the trouble that you experience until you begin fasting. You start really truly fasting. And you see what happens. Do you think the devil's just going to back off? Oh, no. If you've really ever fasted and got really down to prayer with God, you're going to find out it's like a magnet to every demon and imp of hell. They're just drawn to you. You think everything's going to go well? No, it's not. Because you are in a spiritual warfare. You are trying to deny your flesh and you are trying to build your spiritual man. And it takes sacrifice to do that. You know, there are things when we're fasting that don't even bother us on a daily basis. We're not even tempted. But, buddy, you start fasting, and you're going to start craving things that you haven't craved for a long time. And we're going to feel like, oh, this is just such great sacrifice. I'm denying myself of that blizzard. Oh, I know I hadn't had a blizzard in a year, but oh, I want a blizzard. I want, every time I go by Dairy Queen, I just, oh, blizzard. <laughs> now, that's just a simple way of putting a much deeper subject. When we start saying, okay, God, I'm going to draw close to you. I'm going to lean in. I'm going to lead in, which means my body is going to be a little out of balance because I want to lean into you. I want to press to you. I want you. God, I want my life to be a living sacrifice. I want more of you. God, I know that I'm going to face things by me just saying that, that the enemy is going to come. He's going to try to block me, and, and that's when my true character is going to be proved, not when I just come to church or not when I just say I'm a Christian, but when I decide that I'm going to lean into God, I'm going to press in, I want to draw close to God. You're going into a difficult school, my friend. Perseverance through difficult times builds character. 
We need to question everything that happens to us to try to learn the lessons that God is teaching us. Every one of us, it doesn't matter how young you are, it does not matter how old you are, God has lessons that you need to learn. And most of those lessons are not going to be easy to learn. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9, but they, but all they who regard their troubles as necessary trials for their salvation not only rise above them, but also turn them to occasions of joy. Amen. You know, a lot of times people will jo uh, joke, and when they're trying to exhort people to worship, said, if you're in pain, just thank God for your pain. Praise him through your pain. I like to look at it more like this. God, I'm going to praise you regardless. I'm going to exalt you regardless. I remember a number of years ago, I was having a, 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 something was going on in this robust upper body here. <laughs> That I couldn't, I was just in pain. I couldn't lift my arms. And so many times I'd be in worship service and it was just so hard. I couldn't hardly get them. But I would somehow, at some point, I just began, God, I'm just going to lift them as high as I can lift them. I'm going to praise you in this worship. I am not going to deny myself of being able to lift my hands up to you. I'm going to praise you through this circumstance, through this situation. Now, that was just literally arms. But I'm talking about burdens and things that we carry in our lives. We need to be able to say, God, I'm going to praise you. I'm not asking you to resolve it. I'm just going to praise you for it because I know I'm going through this. I'm in this class. I'm learning this lesson. I want to learn everything that you've got for me to learn because at the end of the day, it's going to be an occasion for joy. Weeping will endure for the night, but I know that joy comes in the morning. So... <laughs> So many people spend all their time blaming God for every, we got kids in here, not smart decision. <laughs> you know, we make bad decision after bad decision and then, and then blame God on it. It's your not smart decision. Kids weren't in here, I'd be a little bit more plain. But they who all regard their troubles as a necessary trial. Now that's a hard place. I'm not saying that I've mastered this lesson. <laughs> that they know that these are necessary trials. These troubles are necessary trials. I love that song that says, we'll soon be done with troubles and trials. Amen. As long as we are in this life, there's going to be trouble. This is a world of trouble. It says, for their salvation not only rise above them, rise above that problem and that trouble, but turn them into occasions of joy. Billy Graham came down with Parkinson's disease. And he made this statement. He said, if God has lessons for me to learn, so be it. If God has a lesson for me to learn, so be it. I'm going to learn. Lance Armstrong won the Tour de France seven times, and he said, if I had to choose between winning the Tour de France, I'd take cancer because I learned a whole lot more during my cancer than I ever did in winning one of those races. M Michael J. Fox, when he was, was diagnosed, the doctor said that he had 10 years to act. And he made this statement. He said, if I had to go back to who I was before Parkinson." I would not go back. If they came up with a cure, I would not have taken it. I learned so much from having that disease. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says this, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Suffering brings perseverance. Perseverance brings character. Character brings hope. And when you got hope, you're never disappointed. Can I say that again? Suffering 
brings perseverance. And then perseverance builds your character. And when you got character, you got hope. And when you got hope, nothing else matters. Do you have hope this morning? 1 Peter 1, 6-7 says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be founded to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold. I want to pose a question to you this morning. If someone came up to you this morning, say you're really being tried, there's persecutions, there's a heavy burden that's weighing on you, you're really struggling with something. And someone came up and said, I'll tell you what. You name the figure, I'll pay all your debt off. But you had to choose to give that problem up. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense and some of you have to kind of think through that one. Which would you choose? Would you choose to keep your problems and your issues? Because that's really what's going to build your character. Or you can fill in the other end of the equation, whatever it is that you would need. Which would you choose? Because the Bible says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than any amount of money, it is the supreme blessing. It will stand when this world is on fire, that's what, you know, the saying is, character is not how you act in church or out in public, but it's when you're all alone, that's when your true character comes through. It's not how loud you pray in church. It's not how loud you sing in church. But it's how earnest you pray and you sing when you're alone. That's what builds character. And when we go through the trials of this life, when we lean into God and we try to press and we say, okay, God, I want more of you. You're asking for trouble. If I've done the scripture justice today, that's exactly what happens. It doesn't promise us that we're never going to have a problem, but it promises us that in order to build character, we may have to embrace things we would rather not embrace. It's all about building your character, that the trial of your faith. That's why you can just coast along when you're just kind of in the stream with everybody else. But when you decide to make a stand, you decide to make a stand in your family, you decide to make a stand wherever. doesn't mean everybody's going to stand up and applaud you and say, oh, they're great. You'll probably be persecuted, ridiculed, made fun of, hurt. Because you see, you can't have them both. Christ, sacrifice, look at all the persecution, the pain, all of the lies that were told on him. And he was just trying to save the world. He loved you so much, he went through every hit, through every stripe on his back, through every piercing, through every persecution, through the clothes being ripped off his body and exposed to the world for you. And if we truly love him, we're going to say, God, I will serve you regardless, no matter what happens to me tomorrow. You know what, God? If I lose my job, I'm going to serve you and I'm going to be a Christian. If I lose everything in this life, no matter what I have to face my remaining days, I will serve you regardless. I'll pay the price. And God, if I have to take on pain and persecution, if that's the school of lessons that I've got to attend, I'll take them. 
Because if I can become more like you, if somehow at the end of the day, your favor is on my life, and I can look into the eyes of my Father and know that He's pleased. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. God, I love you. I will serve you regardless of what I have to face in this life. A lot of people want to be leaders, but you see, the great illusion of leadership is to think that man can be led out of the desert by someone who has never been there. I want to read that again. The great illusion of leadership is to think that man can be led out of the desert by someone who's never been in the desert. You want to be a leader? You want to step out? You're going to have to go into the desert. Because you can't lead other people out of the desert unless you come out of it yourself. I've often said it takes hurt people to minister to hurt people. The more you're hurt in your life, the more opportunity of ministry opens up. Amen? The more you suffer through, the more you can help other people. I want to read a beautiful quote. The most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and they found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people don't just happen. Beautiful people just don't happen. In closing today, I want to kind of look back to the life of Apostle Paul. I mean, I can't really find in Scripture. I mean, he would proclaim, it is I, Paul, and all the things that he had went through. But he didn't do it to get pity or to build himself up. He did it so that he could say on that final day, I have fought a good fight. Is that really what you want to be known for? That in the end of the day, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. fought a good fight and I kept the faith I had to go through a lot of character building and a lot of tears and a lot of pain and a lot of struggle but I fought a good fight and I kept the faith and I finished there's seldom things more beautiful I had the privilege of being at the bedside of precious saints of God when they took their last breaths. And there are very th few things more beautiful than that. There's no struggle. I can't even put it into words what it's like. It's just like the Holy Spirit just rushes in the room and wisps their soul out. And it's just peace. And it's quiet. fought a good fight I've kept the faith and I've ran a good race I want to ask you to stand today sacrifice this life of being